Well, I'm glad that you're here this morning. It feels like it's been quite some time since I've been up here, and uh, I'm sure that's a good thing for a lot of you. But here I am, and we are going to hear from the Word of God this morning. So if you would bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would come and be with us this morning. I pray that you would use your Spirit to open our eyes to the message that you have for us. Father, if I'm going to say something that you don't want me to say, I pray that you would take those words from my mind. We want to please you this morning. We want you to work in us and through us, through your holy word. Thank you so much for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are resuming our sermon series on our core values. And today's core value, as you can see, we believe that, God, that doing church as a team is God's design for effective ministry. And that's exactly what we want to be here at Grace Church. We want to be effective. There are so many examples of teams in the Bible. The father-in-law of Moses told Moses, you've got to get a team around you. Moses was getting overwhelmed. He was getting burned out. The entire nation of Israel was knocking on his door every morning, asking him to make judgments on legal cases, asking for advice, asking for him to settle things. His father-in-law says, look, you married my daughter. You need to spend more time with her and your kids. We need to form a team to do ministry. King David had his mighty men. There was a band of mighty men. If you ever get the opportunity, get in the book, I believe it's 1 Samuel, and look up David's mighty men and the things that those guys did. It was a fantastic team that God used in the nation of Israel to do amazing things. Adam and Eve, another great team from the word of God. God knew from the beginning that it was not good for man to be alone. We need community. God gave me a great partner. He gave me Jessica. We complement each other quite nicely. I can mix with lots of different people, whether they're like really rough redneck people or really sophisticated city dwellers. I can mix with just about anyone. And the key to avoiding that social anxiety is I don't really care what people think. Whereas my wife, she cares what people think. We're a nice balance because there are times where I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe they don't like me. I, I, guess, I, don't, I guess I don't really care. Where Jessica will be, she'll be more in tune to what people are thinking, what people are feeling. And when you're ministering to people, you probably should be in tune to those type of things. So she helps balance me out. This may come as a surprise to you, but I am not the most analytical person in the world when it comes to my feelings. I kind of do the caveman thing, just I'll think everything is fine when it's not fine. I'll say something to my wife, Jessica, like, man, my shoulders are killing me. I don't understand why my shoulders hurt so much. And she'll say, well, when you're mad about something or when you're really upset about something, your, your shoulders get really sore. I'm not mad, I'll say to her. I don't understand and all of a sudden, be like, oh yeah, maybe I am a little upset. She helps balance me out. I need her to make me more effective as a husband, as a father, as a pastor. We need each other to be effective doing the kingdom work. Because God didn't give everyone all the gifts. He didn't give one person all the gifts. He gave a diversity of gifts to a lot of different people, and we need all of those gifts to be effective in ministry. Look at a football team. It takes a diversity of talent to win. Even I, myself, I am a devout Lions fan. I have been through so much. I am so committed to this team. But I can see where some people would be under the impression that Aaron Rodgers is a good quarterback, maybe even a great quarterback. However, if the Green Bay Packers had a team full of Aaron Rodgers, they would lose every game. Because he doesn't have the speed to play defensive back. He doesn't have the toughness to play the line. They would lose every game, and it wouldn't even be close. They probably wouldn't even score a point. 
We need a diversity of gifts and talents and people to make church ministry successful. So what does a win look like for the church? If the church is successful, what does a win look like? Matthew 28, 16 through 20 is called the Great Commission. This was kind of like the marching orders that Jesus gave when he left planet Earth. This is what I want you to do. I'm leaving. I'm coming back. I want you to do this while I'm gone. I used to get the same speech from my parents. Like, they would leave. We want you to accomplish these things while we're gone. And if you don't get them done by the time we come back, there'll be consequences. It's the same general concept. Let me read it for you. Now the 11 disciples, verse 16, chapter 28. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When we make disciples, we win as a church. We're really given four jobs in that passage. Okay, make disciples, baptize, observe all that I have commanded you, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then it says, I am with you always to the end of the age. We need to be close to Jesus. Okay, you may not be the greatest evangelist in the world. So maybe the making disciples thing is going to be a little tough, but maybe you're a great teacher because that job's up there, too. You see, we have a lot that we need to get done, and we need you to do it. We're going to learn three lessons about doing church as a team. And the first lesson is this. We are on one team. Okay? We're all on the same team. Whether you are a church member in China or you are here in Gladstone, Michigan, we're all on the same team. If you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, or scroll on your phone, whatever you've got. Please uh, turn to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. If we are to do church as a team, as God designed, then we must get ready to play. You can't just join a team, show up on day one of practice, a sport you've never played, and expect to be a real contributor. We need to prepare ourselves to play. Chap- Ephesians chapter 4, follow along in your Bibles. Verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Jesus set up different offices in the church corresponding to their different duties. You could take those positions, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, you could call them positions on a team, okay? So think of it that way if it helps you to understand the concept better. Each has an end goal. Each one of those positions has an end goal found in verses 13 and 14. Until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So I think Paul's trying to address something in Ephesus. I think that these guys are falling for a lot of simple tricks, theologically speaking. They're getting fooled in a lot of different areas. As a pastor, I want to prepare you to recognize whether it's false gospel, whether someone's taking a verse in popular culture and twisting it to make it mean what it doesn't actually mean. I want to equip you guys with the ability to say, hmm, that, that doesn't really match up with the rest of Scripture. That doesn't really make sense with what I know, with who I know God to be. We don't have the earthly presence of Jesus, so we've got some work to do. We have 
five things that we need to accomplish. We need to do the work of ministry. And these five things are found in those verses that I just read. We need to do the work of ministry. We need to build up the body of Christ. Number three, we need to be unified in the faith. Number four, grow in our knowledge of Jesus. Number five, mature in our faith. If we do these things, we'll be dynamic and effective in our ministry here at Grace Church. Verses 15 through 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it can build itself up in love. Maturity means we have the conviction to follow through on what is right. It's about those verses we read just a little while ago where you can recognize, you know what, that's not biblical. That's not right. That's not something that I should be doing or that I should be believing. Maturity means we have a conviction to follow through on what is right. The large majority of people who walk into my office sit down on my couch and say, Pastor, I've got a problem. I don't know what to do. The large majority, I would say even 85% of those people, they know exactly what to do. They know exactly what the right thing to do is. It's just really hard. It's going to cause them to change a habit in their life. It's going to cause them maybe to say no to a relationship that they're in. But they usually know what the right thing to do is. However, they will come to me as a pastor, and maybe I'll give them a workaround. Maybe I'll say, oh, you can keep that relationship. You can keep that bad habit if you just do A, B, and C. But maturity in the faith says, no, that's wrong. That's not healthy. That's not making me more like Jesus. And they turn from it. I want you guys and myself to be mature in our faith. So when we encounter a problem, something we don't understand, we can look to God's word, call it for what it is, and solve the problem. Lesson number two that we learn from God's word on effective team ministry is that all teams have rules. So if we're going to be on this team, what are the rules? I've been on lots of teams. I've been on football teams, baseball teams, wrestling teams, rugby teams, track teams, lots of teams. I've been on ministry teams. All teams have rules. And when I was on these teams, we had rules about respect. You know, you respect your coaches, your opponents, your teammates, officials. You show up ready and prepared for practice. Lots of rules, some of which I did really good on. Others, I paid the price for not doing so great on those rules. We had rules about being good citizens in the classroom and in the community, and Coach made it very clear to us, if you break those rules in the classroom, you're going to have to deal with the consequences that the teacher or principal gives you, and then you'll have a whole new set of consequences that I give you here at practice. There are rules for every team, and part of those rules, those rules make up the identity of that team. It's a big part of the identity. We have rules given to us by the word of God that make up a big part of our, our identity, and I want to share those with you this morning. So we're still in Ephesians 4. Now we're in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming, verse 21, that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, very important, to put off our old self. We're going to talk about that a little later which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Verse 24, and to, put off the new, and to put on the new self 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. We are members of one team. Verse 26, be angry. Probably never thought you'd hear that in the Bible. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Finally, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. All right? So this is going to be part of your homework, okay? So make sure you write these rules down. I am going to give you the John Pote's version of the rules I read in there. And then I want you to take my rules, and I want you to take that passage, and I want you to compare the two, see if I'm crazy, okay? Don't just take my word for everything that you hear up here. Study it for yourself. You'll find that I am crazy, but it's not because of this. Ver rule number one, live a life set apart. Live differently than the lost. Get to know Jesus. Dig deep in his words. Dig deep in his word. Number two, avoid sensual, greedy, impure living. You know, those words, sensual, greedy, impure, they make me think of the flesh. But if you're on Team Jesus, when people see you, they shouldn't think of the flesh. They, th they should think of Jesus, okay? Rule number three, put off your old self. Put off your old self. I can't understate this rule enough. When I was on the wrestling team back in high school, I was like a different person. Football would end. We'd have a two-week break. Coach would start voluntary conditioning like the day after football ended, and then we would be wrestlers until mid-February, depending on how well we did in the postseason. I lived by different rules when I was on that team. I didn't drink any pop. I didn't eat any junk food. I would hydrate all day. I always got enough sleep. I would skip parties. I would skip games, school functions, so I could get enough sleep. I wanted to be at my absolute best. I didn't want to have any excuses for losing. I even quit my job at an Italian restaurant. I worked at an Italian restaurant through high school, and they would let me quit during wrestling season because there was no way I was going to make weight if I continued to work at that Italian restaurant because when I was on the clock, you had to make your own food. That was their way to train you. I started out as a dishwasher, and they would... You could eat whatever you want as long as you made it yourself. And that's how you learned how to make all the items on the menu. And I tried to eat all the items on the menu, which was really great for football season. You know, bulk up, put on a little weight. But wrestling season is the opposite effect. And I had to quit because my coach is like, he'd weigh us every day after practice. He's like, something's not right here. You don't seem to be like dropping weight like you should be. And it was because I was not living by good rules for that sport. When we join God's team, we have to become different people. We have to put off our old self. We have to live by different rules. And hopefully our lives, lived by those rules, will point people to Jesus. Rule number four, tell the truth. You know the truth. You know the gospel. You have to speak it. You can't just live it and hope that people figure it out. You need to speak the gospel. You need to share your faith. Rule number five, don't sin in your anger. Don't make sin, sinful anger, a lifestyle. Sometimes the church gets a reputation for being angry. That's not good because that's not who Jesus was. 
There were times when Jesus was angry when he was in the temple. But we don't want a reputation as being an angry people group because that's not who Jesus was. Rule number six, work hard, be honest, be generous. Work hard, be honest, be generous. I want to make sure you have enough time to write these down. Rule number seven, let your speech point others to Christ. That comes from Ephesians 4.29. My youth pastor used to quote that verse to me all the time because I thought I was really funny and I had a lot of good things to say and sometimes I wasn't very funny and I hurt people's feelings. It goes back to the whole not caring what people think of me thing, okay? So my youth pastor would come to me and say, you know that joke you made or that story you told? Did that point people to Jesus or did that point people to you? Uh, probably pointed me to you or pointed people to me. So that is a great reminder. Ephesians 4.29, let your speech point others to Christ. Rule number eight, trust and obey the Spirit. It's very simple. It's a simple concept. Trust and obey. When we trust, we recognize God's plan is better than my plan. I have to trust him in that. Number two, I have to obey that plan. Number nine, be kind and forgiving. Be kind and forgiving. If we live by those nine rules found in Ephesians 17 through 32, I think, um, we're going to point people to Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's do that. We need you to do that. Okay? Lesson number three, teamwork makes the dream work. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27. We're going to learn about teamwork. And this is where you come in, okay? So we've discovered that we're on God's team and that his purpose is to do the work of ministry. We've discovered the team rules. And now we're going to see how the team works. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it, so it is with, Jesus, with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So I'm just going to pause here. Verse 13, Jews, Greeks, slaves, and free. That is a diverse people group, like drastically different. The Greek culture, the Jewish culture, culture were like oil and water. Being a slave, being free, there was vast differences in how those two people groups felt about each other. And God says, I want you all on this team. I want you all in the same church. We need to embrace that. We need to embrace the fact that we are different from one another. And we need to use that diversity of personality and gifts to do the work, to do the work of the church. Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand... I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would, make, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing, where, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts at the of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. 
our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, listen to this, okay? Verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and the individual members of it. The body is diverse. We have Greeks, Jews, slave, and free. The body is diverse. The ministry is diverse. Imagine if I had to take this pencil or this ink pen and I had to pick that up with my nose. It would probably be very entertaining for all of you to watch me attempt to do that, but I would not be very effective because that's not what a nose is designed for. Noses aren't good at picking things up. We need a diversity of gifts. Imagine if everyone was like me, okay? The worship ministry at Grace Church would be abysmal. It would be terrible. Every once in a while, while I'm sitting over here during worship time, I hear this awful noise. And I'm thinking, what is Pastor Dave doing up there? Like, why does it sound so bad? And then I realize, that awful noise is my voice. <laughs> Somebody left my microphone on. What's happening? The children's ministry at Grace Church, if everyone was like me, would be terrible. Kids would be running around, all sugared up, having a great time, but probably not learning as they should be. I need Pastor Dave. I need Pastor Jason. I need our elders. These guys have wisdom and experience that I don't have. We need a diversity of personalities, talents, and gifts in order to play the game. Just like a team full of Aaron Rodgers is not going to be successful, a team full of me is not going to be successful. Think of Grace Church like a puzzle, okay? There's probably 500 people here uh, between this service and the next service. So let's call it a 500-person puzzle. Each piece is equally important. And you may be sitting there thinking, man, I don't feel important. I really don't. You know, I feel like one of those pieces of the puzzle that's like sky or like grass. Like just, it's just one color. It's just kind of bland, not important. Like I don't matter. Like I don't feel like I've got like a really great gift. I guarantee you, if you put that puzzle together and you'd be like, oh, look at this piece of the sky. It's just blue. There's like a little wispy part of a cloud. That's not important. Put it all together. And I've, I've done puzzles before. Put it all together, and that one piece is missing. You call the family, hey, guys, come and look at my puzzle. That I did. First thing they're going to notice is, the piece is missing. Well, it's a boring piece. It doesn't, it's nothing too exciting. It's no big deal. Don't worry about that. It's just a little piece of the sky. No, it's a piece of the puzzle, and it's missing. We need you nondescript person at Grace Church, whoever you may be, just a piece of the sky, we need you. If you're not here using your gifts, involved in the ministry, the picture is not complete. We need you. I have a great youth team. I've been doing youth ministry for 15 years. I have a great youth deacon, Tom Watuni, he's a great guy, thoughtful, creative, I have a great team. I've been doing this job a while. But on a regular basis, those people, my volunteers, come up to me and they say, hey, I've got this idea, and it's a great idea. I need those people. I can't do it all myself. We need you here at Grace Church. We really do. I would not be a good financial secretary here at Grace Church. Come in on Monday morning and be like, so how's the church doing? Well, we're broke. <laughs> Why are we broke? Pastor John gave away all the money again. My wife gets really nervous when it comes time to tip the waitress at the restaurant because I just like to imagine like 
her face when she sees that tip or his face. So like you'll go to fill out the debit card receipt and like put a really good tip on there. And, you know, I just, I get really excited thinking about, you know, a hardworking waitress and she sees that tip and be like, yes. But, you know, I go home and I'm like, honey, how come the power's not on? Well, you gave all our money away to that waitress. <laughs> I... I get really excited about giving money away. So I would not be a good financial secretary. The last part of that passage, we learn about the body when it's hurting, when members are hurting. When I was in the 10th grade, I went to a wrestling camp. I'll make this story brief. But in the process of wrestling, I'm, I'm in a match. The, the camp counselor set up a tournament. I'm wrestling. And I get slammed, and I land kind of on my face, and I bit my tongue, like, really bad. Like, really bad. And I, I know we, like, you bite your tongue, it's annoying, but I bit my tongue so bad that it was, like, swelling up, and I was miserable. I mean, my tongue's only, like, probably, like, that big. But I was miserable. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't perform on the wrestling mat at the level that I normally could. I didn't hold it against my tongue that it got hurt. Oh, you should have been more careful. You should have stayed away from the teeth, you know, like right in the middle where you're supposed to be. I didn't cast judgment on my tongue for, no. But we do that here at Grace Church, don't we? Sometimes when people are hurting. I mean, that's my problem. I struggle with empathy sometimes. Well, you're in this situation because you're an idiot, right? <laughs> that doesn't help people. People know usually, yeah, I made a mistake, I, but I need help, you know, picking up the pieces. We need to do a better job. When one part of us is hurting, we need to take care of the body. Okay? Thank you. Sometimes when we do that, though, we have to say some hard things. When someone's hurting, we have to say some hard things like, this is what the Bible says and this is what you're doing, so you need to change what you're doing. That's okay, but we have to speak that truth in love. All right? Okay, application. We're almost done. Point number one, we are one unified team. Do you need to forgive someone or do you need to ask for forgiveness, okay? Okay. So when it comes to application, this is the stuff I really want you to remember from the sermon, okay? So please write it down. Application. Do you need to be forgiven or ask forgiveness? Okay, I'll give you a little time to write that down. A lot of words. Number two. Live by the team rules. If you're on the team, if you're in the family of God, you need to live by the team rules. We're on number two. Application point number two. Live by the team rules. Number three. Do your part. Play your position. You're like that puzzle piece. We need you. We need you here at Grace Church. We're going through a difficult time here at Grace Church. People have left. We need you to double down and get involved. Okay? I don't want to stand up here next Sunday and say, hey, VBS, it's still coming. We still need volunteers. I want to be able to say, hey, please form an orderly line. Everyone will get their chance to volunteer, okay? Application point number three, do your part, play your position. Homework, read and study Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. Read and study 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27 and Ephesians 4. The whole sermon came from that. So I want you to read and study that for yourself. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Make sure I'm teaching you the right thing. And then the last thing is memorize Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. Write it down. Memorize it this week. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your great love for us. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be the teammates and the people.
that we really need to be. I pray that you would give us that commitment to your word that we need in order to be successful in leading others to Christ. I pray that you would make us into the people and the teammates that lift each other up. I pray, God, that we wouldn't turn on our own body, but that we would be used in the healing of this body. We love you so much, and we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name.